Good evening and uh, praise the Lord, brothers and sisters, uh, wherever you are tuned in around the world and in East Africa. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to uh, our, our, our conference panel discussion, day five, um, where we are dealing with the issue of uh, uh, Jesus' nature and his incarnation. Was Christ still divine in his incarnation? And if so, what constituted his divine nature and uh, uh, does these things uh, have any implications on uh, our salvation uh, uh, in whichever thing that um, uh, we believe in or uh, really we can just uh, uh, believe in anything and uh, uh, still be saved. And so uh, I want to thank the Lord so much because uh, he has been good. Yeah, as I was saying that uh, I want to thank the Lord so much because he has been good and uh, we have seen his hand guiding us through uh, this session. And uh, just before I pray and uh, proceed to the issues at hand, I can tell you, brethren, that uh, I have been blessed uh, more than ever before uh, because uh, it has been really uplifting. It has been really... Uh, good to see brethren discuss things without passion, without throwing words, without condemning, uh, without pushing other people on the wall and uh, uh, being able to see eye to eye. I can say that um, this is the experience of uh, uh, the upper room. This is the experience of the upper room in the book of Acts chapter one. And uh, I believe with all my heart that uh, this is the kind of unity that Christ was talking about in the book of uh, John chapter 17 and um, uh, what um, uh, the psalmist said in the book of Psalms 133 uh, about uh, 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 how good when brothers dwell together or brethren dwell together in, uh, in peace and uh, uh, in unity. And uh, uh, you understand the book of Psalms is in the context of the day of atonement because Aaron is mentioned there and Aaron was a high priest who was uh, entering into the most holy place once in the year in the day of atonement. And so after the sacrifices had been accepted, the anointing will flow from Aaron. And what was this anointing? Uh, that the Shekinah glory will be revealed in the most holy place and then the token will be a blessing to the people. When the high priest came from the most holy place, he was shining and the people knew that uh, actually uh, they had come to be blessed by the high priest. And so uh, I believe that uh, the Lord is doing something all over the world so that uh, his children may come into that perfect unity and then uh, 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 be able to see eye to eye and be able to sound the loud cry. Before I, I pray, I will want to read one quote, uh, LDA 197.2, a quote I love so much, and then we pray, and then we begin. 197.2, 179.2, uh, LDE 179.2. Uh, this is uh, one of them of my favorite quotes uh, in E.G. White um, writing. It says, that uh, the great issue so near at hand enforcement of Sunday laws will weed out those whom God has not appointed and he will have a pure, true, sanctified ministry prepared for the latter rain. This was written in 1886 and they were just headed to the Minneapolis conference in 1888 where the message of righteousness by faith was being preached, was preached and it was a catalyst to the loud cry and the latter rain. And so, I can see whatever we are doing is that uh, the Lord is sanctifying a people who can see eye to eye, a ministry that can go forth and sound the uh, loud cry. And so I want us to pray and then be able uh, to start uh, this evening panel uh, discussion. Shall we humble ourselves? Abba Father in heaven, thank you so much that uh, you have again gathered us that uh, we may discuss your word. What a privilege in such a times when people are following after the world. Are we better than those who have not come into this session? Lord, 
even it is worse if we are assembled here and then miss the blessings that you want to declare upon us. It were better if we were not here. And so we are not at the best position, but uh, we are at the most perilous position because if we hear the things that uh, we have to hear and not go to do it, really uh, we shall be uh, found wanting and our judgment shall be greater than those who have never heard the truth. And so I pray that your sanctifying influence may be upon us you may minister unto us directly from the throne of heaven that the glory may shine forth in our hearts, that uh, when the truth comes to our minds, we may leap like uh, calves and uh, rejoice that, Lord, you are working among us. And so take eminent, take chance uh, to minister unto us. And uh, Lord, as the message of righteousness by faith is to lay the glory of man to dust and do to man what that which he cannot do by himself, we just pray that this moment the glory of man may be laid to dust completely, that Christ may have his way and no human beings may be worshipped as idols being seated on the throne of God. Thank you for everything and thank you for thy loving kindness. In, in Jesus' name, we pray of these things. Amen. Amen. And so, uh, welcome, Brother Cliff. That is uh, weekly for Monday. Welcome, Brother Junior Sirungu. And uh, welcome uh, Brother Bernard and the team in Rongo, Eldakos Gay, and those who are really doing the work there. Uh, uh, we thank everyone for joining in. And uh, for the first time I'm seeing Brother Weekly from Diwa. Uh, I, I know you are with your team there. And uh, Brother Weekly, you are using the sun or what are you using? Unmute yourself and talk to us, Brother Weekly for what? Is that the sun or you are using a candle or you are using a lamp? What is happening there? You are still muted rather weekly for war. You are muted, you are still muted. Is it okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. How are you doing? Okay, I'm doing fine. Maybe you. I am well. Why have you decided to use the sun instead of using the electricity? <laughs> the sun, okay. So, um, just <laughs> we, 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 we thank the Lord uh, we clip. I hope, who are you with there? Are you alone or you are, you are with somebody? I'm alone. Uh, the team is uh, still in the, in the, in the kitchen. <laughs> No, no problem. Let them prepare a meal and then uh, I know you will pass the information to them that uh, they have to hear these things half past time. Hey, you people don't be like uh, Mary and uh, Martha. You know, those two people, Martha decided that uh, she will go to cook. Mary then sat at Jesus' feet and Martha missed everything. That is just, uh, uh, by the way, <laughs> take it lightly like that. And so welcome okay. everyone and uh, welcome Elder Kefa and your family and uh, welcome Elder Kimaru and your family. We are dealing with the issue, let me project it once again, and, uh, we can, um, and we can mute ourselves if we are not talking. We are on day five, Jesus' nature in his incarnation. Was Christ still divine in his incarnation? And if so, what constituted his divine nature? And so I hope that uh, we will discuss and uh, Today, I'd like us to explore our Bible much. But if you have uh, something from E.G. White, I'm at liberty. Bring whatever you can bring. Say whatever you can say so that uh, we may learn together. But um, if we will have the word of God, then uh, I can promise you that uh, we are going to have a good time uh, so that uh, if we can understand the word of God better, then we will be in a position to be able to understand even, uh, 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 we will be able to understand even what uh, uh, E.G. White is talking about. And so just to start us off, please don't keep silent on me. Uh, I have talked for the last three days, I'm exhausted. And uh, I want to give you people a chance. It, this, this, not, uh, this was not a preaching or a teaching. It was a panel discussion. And I want your questions. I want your submissions. 
you have five minutes, you have 10 minutes to give your submission, we will listen. And then we can react to it without, um, uh, without uh, debating. We can react to it to correct each other if there's any correction and admonish each other in a free way so that uh, the Lord may bless us together. I'd like us to start us off and uh, I hope and I know you know where I'm going to start. What is the best place to start? Brother Junior Sirung, I, 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 want, I want to put you on the spot. If you want to learn a doctrine, what is the best place for you to start? Brother Junior Sirung. Hello, guys. Hello to you. Uh, okay. I would say to go to the Bible, to really read uh, upon uh, three, two or three witnesses, that is the examples given in the Bible, so that I can know what is the extent or the totality of it. But, uh, you know, I, I would just say that. I would say that. Brother Junior Sirungu, that is a half a mark. You have failed halfly. Yes, you start in the Bible, but where? I'm still on you. I don't want you to fail. I want you to, to get 100%. Okay, I would go to, um, is it, is it Timothy? Is it, let's see, let's look at it. Let's, <laughs> let me read it. <laughs> let's read it, because I would rather not have to say stuff. Let's read it. It's in Timothy, let me see. Uh, and I thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Second Timothy 3. Yes. Second Timothy 3 from verse 15 onwards. Or oh, really uh, rather 16. The, 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 the word of God uh, is God breath. It has the Holy Spirit and uh, it is good for reproof, admonition and all that stuff, is it? Yes. Still you have your half mark. So I'll save you the day. The best place okay. to establish the doctrine is to go to Genesis. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I, I hope you take that kindly. So let us go yes. to Genesis because that is where you have to store. If you don't have anything in Genesis, then you don't have it in the Bible, actually. And so I, I, I want to read something that uh, maybe we don't consider a lot when uh, we are establishing our doctrines. Never establish a doctrine from other parts of the Bible. Every doctrine is in the book of Genesis. If you can find it in the book of Genesis, then there is no way you are going to find it. You can find it like uh, you know how you used to do maths in school. You are told that uh, solve this equation. You know the answer, but you don't know the formula. But uh, a good teacher then will go and mark the formula and not the answer. So he fails the formula. And if he fails the formula, then it doesn't matter how correct your answer is, you are wrong. But uh, we are not to gauge that. Um, what uh, I wanted really to bring home is that uh, if you want to establish a doctrine, please, brethren, try to find it in Genesis because it is there. After you try and find it in Genesis, then the other verses are just a build up to that doctrine that um, really you are uh, you are actually uh, 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 looking for. And then after you finish Genesis, if you don't find this thing in Genesis, then go to the book of Exodus. If you don't find it in the Exodus, then go like that until you reach at the end at Revelation. But if you miss in those two books, then I don't think we'll ever find it uh, in the book of, uh, in any other book. Why do I say that? The book of Genesis starts before the fall and before sin. The book of Exodus really brings out the, uh, the remedy of what has happened in the book of Genesis. And so any other doctrines that will deal with remedial plans, if they were not pointed up in the succeeding chapters from Genesis chapter three, then they are in the book of Exodus where actually Christ uh, tells Moses, build me a sanctuary. And in the sanctuary therein is any other doctrine that will ever preach to anyone. In the sanctuary is where all other doctrines actually 
uh, 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 comes into place. And uh, and, 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 and also, you, you must um, understand in 1844, they said that uh, when the sanctuary was opened to us, it was a, a, a stone with astonished eyes that um, we came to understand the doctrine of the sanctuary because in it, there were other all other doctrines that um, were to be given to the church. So let us go to Genesis. The issue we are dealing with uh, as I start is, um, Day five, Jesus' nature in his incarnation, was Christ still divine in his incarnation? And if so, what constituted uh, uh, his uh, divine nature? And so I'll go to the book of Genesis and establish something. The book of Genesis chapter one, and uh, And uh, I am uh, in um, the third day of creation. I'm in the third day of creation. Welcome, Elder Patrick Angasa. We are uh, in the book of Genesis. We are just starting. And uh, we are trying to establish what kind of nature did Jesus Christ have when he came and uh, if uh, uh, establish uh, which nature he had and if it is important to us and if it is salvific or it is something also we should put aside it is not part of the three angels message. So I was saying that to establish every doctrine, you must go back to the book of Genesis. If it is not in Genesis, then it is not there. And if you miss it in Genesis, because Genesis is uh, the book that talks before sin ended, Exodus is the solution to the remedial plan. And so in these two books are all other doctrines. And so uh, the book of Genesis on the third day of creation. Look at what Jesus Christ uh, uh, tells Moses to write uh, on the third day. <clears throat> that is verse nine. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Verses 10. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called in the seas and God saw that it was good. Verse 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit, and underline the word after his kind. Uh, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Verse 12, and the earth, and the earth, brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, also put after his kind. And the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after this kind and God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the third day. Now that is so interesting because the third day is the midst of the week. And uh, I, I just want to say something. When Christ came to die on the cross, it was in the midst of the week of the plan of redemption. When the earth was almost 4,000 years, because the earth has been given almost uh, 6,000 years to exist, then the 7,000 year we are in heaven. So he came in the midst of the week. Now, if he came in the midst of the week, he had to be after his own kind. Because everything was to bring forth what was of his own kind. But you will say, was Jesus really human? But um, to, to be able to do the redemption plan, did Jesus Christ to be like his brethren? And that is what I'm really exactly saying that Christ had to be exactly of our own kind, so as to be able to redeem us. And I, I established that. And um, uh, uh, because if two kinds of seed come together, if two seeds come together, which are not of the same kind, God prohibits it in the book of Leviticus, that the two seeds shall not intermingle, should not actually procreate two seeds of different kind. Only of the same kind are to procreate uh, or um, are, uh, to come into intercourse and produce of their same kind. And so we see that on the third day in the midst of the week, Christ came for the redemption plan and he had to be like his own brethren to redeem them. 
you say that is heresy, but uh, I, I, I'll put out um, something also that supports that. Uh, look at um, if somebody had to be redeemed from a debt, what was to happen? The book of Leviticus, the book of Leviticus chapter 25, the book of Leviticus chapter 25, verses 47. Leviticus chapter 25, verses 47. It says, and if a sojourner or a stranger works rich by thee and by thy brother that dwelleth by him works poor, and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner by thee or to the stock of the stranger's family. So if there happens something that one sells himself to another one. Now in Genesis, really we were sold to sin, to the devil by yielding unto him. We were sold to sin by the devil by yielding unto him. And now the Lord uh, wants to buy us back or redeem us back from the clutches of the evil one. The Lord wants us to buy us back. So if one be sold to a stranger, as even we have been sold to the devil, somebody has to redeem us. And if that somebody has to redeem the one who has been sold, who was qualified to redeem that person? Continued in Leviticus chapter 25, it says, uh, verse 48, after that he is sold, he may be redeemed. So we were sold to the devil, but we must be redeemed. Again, one of his brethren may redeem him. Now, the word brethren means of the same stock, of the same family, of the same family root. Verses um, 50, uh, 49, either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him, or if he be able, he may redeem himself. And so you establish that the one who had to redeem, the one who was sold, was be, to be from the same stock or was to be from the same blood. They were to be relatives. And then verse 50, and he shall reckon with him that bought him from the year that he was sold to him unto the year of jubilee. So he shall pay a price until the year of jubilee. And what we are waiting for is the jubilee so that we may be redeemed fully from the one who has bought us. That is why Christ has not come because we have not reached the year of Jubilee, so that he may take us from the one who has sold us. The price must be paid that uh, kept us until that period of Jubilee. It says, and he shall reckon with him that bought him from the year that he was sold to him unto the year of Jubilee, <clears throat> And the price of his sale shall be according to the number of years. According to the time of unhired servant shall he be, uh, shall it be with him. So the price shall be according to the numbers that of the years that lead up to Jubilee. Now, if you are paying somebody some money, that will be a lot of money. But man was redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, which no price can match. And so the devil cannot say that he has not been paid the price of redemption to take us. And we know that the devil inspired people to kill Jesus Christ. But in that, he was just fulfilling the counsel of peace that God had reached with his son, that if anything could happen like this, he will be the kinsman redeemer. 51, if there be yet many years behind according unto them, he shall give, he shall give again the price of redemption out of the money that was bought for. And so uh, again, we see that when Jesus Christ died, 
he buys us with his precious blood, but that is not only the price he buys us with. After buying us, that is only the money of buying us. So there is the buying of the property, but that is not the whole transaction. So he buys us by his blood that he sheds on Calvary, but he has to do something if the years are extended, the, the years that lead us uh, lead up to Jubilee, verses 52. And if there remain but few years unto the year of Jubilee, then he shall count with him and according unto his years, shall he give him again the price of his redemption. So there is the price of buying and there is again the price of bringing in just about when the Jubilee is about to happen. Verses 53, and as a yearly hired servant shall he be with him, and the other shall not rule with vigor over him in this sight. And if he be not redeemed in these years, then he shall go out in the year of Jubilee, both he and his children with him. For unto me the children of Israel are servants, they are my servants, whom I bought, brought from out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. So the two things happen uh, to complete the redemption from the kinsman redeemer. There is the buying, and that is the buying with the blood, and there is the bringing. Now, if you buy things and they are bad, for we are bad, but Christ bought us, then when you bring the things in, if you want them to be beneficial to you, if you bring them in, you must do something to them. This is the second paying of the redemption, and Christ brings us in with him by his Holy Spirit. So there is the buying by the blood and the bringing by the spirit. Now you find that uh, Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. You can read that in the book of Esther, uh, 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 the story of uh, uh, Boaz uh, 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 redeeming actually uh, Ruth, redeeming Ruth, uh, uh, because he was the kinsman redeemer. And so that kind of establishes uh, the doctrine that Jesus Christ was of our same kind, and that is why he could redeem us. Also, Christ could not minister as the redeemer if he was not of or our own kind. Look at the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter uh uh, that is Hebrews chapter what? Chapter five, look at Hebrews chapter five. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in the things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. So Christ to be the high priest, he had to be a man and be selected amongst men so that he may represent men in both offering gifts and sacrifices unto God. Now, that is just the half story. I want us now to come in and start developing the plot. Which nature did Jesus Christ have? And does it matter for the plan of redemption? Welcome. That was my submission, and I now welcome your views and your contribution and your question. I, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, in Galatians, let's see, Galatians chapter, let's see, it's chapter four chapter four and verse four. This is just for clarification on my end because uh, I have come to understand or somebody was telling me how the, the, the seven days of creation really fit in the redemption plan. And uh, I, I appreciate that you have uh, referred to the third day being that Christ came in, came in our kind. 
uh, I see that uh, Galatians 4 from verse 4 says, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because he has sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, of which I now I have connected the buying price and also the part of sanctification. Thank you. Uh, the part, uh, the question I have is, we have, or you are, we have helped us to understand the third day, the third day of which it being in this plan of redemption for uh, 7,000 years, half, I, I believe Christ was coming 4,000 years. So it's the fourth day, counting as one day being a thousand years. I could be wrong, but I am happy to really get that elaboration or clarification from someone so that I could connect it because that part of being the third day, it being half, I really didn't know. And now that that has been said, I would like more, more information, please. Thank you. Thank you, brother Junius. And uh, uh, I wanted to jog our minds and uh, I hope uh, they, they will be really jogged for that. Uh, if anyone has an answer, he can answer that. Uh, I don't want to do another submission on that, but uh, I can provide information uh, where, whenever it is needed about that. Is there anyone with that? Yes, there is a hand raised by Rongo Evangelist. I know pe many people are there, so whoever has raised it, they can just go ahead and contribute. There is the team with Ben and Kosge. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, this is Steve M. talking. Yes, Steve. Yes, uh, we appreciate for the study. And uh, we are really thankful for the introduction part that you've taken us through. And uh, just to uh, just to add a, a, a small addition in the, in the question that you've asked, that is, uh, did Christ came in a human nature? Uh, that is what I would love to uh, emphasize on that. Uh, really, for Christ to redeem us, he came uh, in our nature, that is uh, human nature. And that one we'll see, and I'll also give a reason why. I will just have to read uh, one quotation, uh, and uh, I'll leave for, uh, for our brethren if there is if there is anyone who can have any addition. That is in DA, Desire of Ages, uh, 48, paragraph 6. Uh, I believe you've given us a good foundation that for us to be redeemed, uh, someone of our own, of our kind is, was the one to redeem us. Now in 48, if you begin from 6, paragraph 6, I can read. I don't know whether you can put it on the screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, the story of the story of Bethlehem is an exhaustless theme. In it is hidden the depth of riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. We marvel at the Savior's sacrifice in exchanging the throne of heaven for the for the manger and uh, the companionship of ador adoring angels for the beast of the stall. Human pride and self-sufficiency stand rebuked in his presence, yet this was but the beginning of his wonderful condensation. It would have been an almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take man's nature, even when Adam stood in, in his innocent in Eden, but Jesus accepted humanity when uh, when the race had been weakened by four thousand years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted uh, the result of the working of the great law of 
heredity uh, that uh, what this result were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestors. I now listen to this uh, friend Skinley that he came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us the example of sinful, uh, sinless uh, life. So as I can uh, maybe talk a little of this one that Christ came uh, to give us the example of sinful life. So uh, uh, we know that uh, Christ was to present us holy unto Christ. And this is what he came to show us that uh, we can live a sinful life and then uh, a sinless life and then we be presented holy unto God. And uh, if you continue in paragraph 7, a portion that says, Yet into the world where Satan claimed dominion, God permitted his son to come a helpless babe subjected to the weakness of humanity. And we know very well that uh, in the book, uh, Matthew 4, I believe 48, that it was for us to be perfect. And the standard of perfection was uh, that of God. And now this one could only happen to us, sinners, that Christ came and showed us that uh, with this sinful uh, nature, he came in a, a thin sinful generation and shows us that indeed we can be perfect. Uh, even as God is perfect uh, by his example that he shows us. He permitted him to meet life perils in common with every human soul to fight the, the battle as every child of un humanity. So uh, by fighting the battle as every child of humanity uh, must, uh, must fight it at the risk of failure and eternal laws. So this is uh, indeed uh, uh, interesting that Christ, upon his coming to this earth, uh, came uh, totally uh, human so that we might uh, see that indeed uh, we sinners, we can also be presented uh, holy unto the Lord as it, is in uh, as it is stated in the holy oracles of the Lord. And so maybe if we see uh, Matthew uh, 448 uh, that is uh, we have to attain the perfection and the standard is given there that the perfection of God and so uh, for us to uh, attain this Christ showed us that example and that uh, that is why I believe uh, Christ uh, came in a human nature for a sinner like me uh, to see that indeed I also, uh, by looking unto Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith, I can indeed say that I can be presented perfect uh, before the Lord. Uh, uh, 548, 548, it says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So I believe these were... Uh, Christ words himself that we be perfect even as the Father is perfect. This one could only be happen uh, uh, when we see Christ as the author and the finisher of our faith who came in a human uh, nature. Uh, thank you and blessings. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Brother Steve, for your contribution. Just to add on what uh, you have before I give another person a chance, is that we read uh, in um, 3SM 140.2, this was written in 1886. The Lord Jesus came to our world not to reveal what God could do, but what a man could do through faith in God's power to help in every emergency. Man is through faith to be a partaker in the divine nature and to overcome every temptation wherewith he is beset. The Lord now demands that every son and daughter of Adam, through faith in Jesus Christ, serve him in the human nature which we now have. That is the submission from Brother Steve. Any other submission? Uh, yes. Uh, good evening. Good evening to you, Brother Wycliffe. 
Yes, uh, we thank God for uh, for the submissions from you and uh, my brother Steve. Uh, when you are reading the book of Leviticus chapter 25 about Christ being made uh, the next of king uh, and also him coming in uh, in the nature of uh, uh, of man, the human flesh. I just want to have something from Hebrews chapter two, uh, just to establish further on what has been presented. Uh, it says, uh, Hebrews chapter two from verses 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. So that is Jesus Christ, just as we are made, uh, that is the same way that in incarnation, he was brought forth uh, uh, by Mary through uh, having those, <clears throat> uh, those attributes. He also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death that is the devil and deliver them who through fear of death were all uh, their lifetime subject to bondage. It continued to say, verse 16, of Hebrews chapter two, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Uh, this tells us, uh, we know that uh, Abraham was the, uh, the father of, uh, uh, of many nations. And uh, actually, uh, if you read Galatians chapter four, we are told about, um, uh, you know, Isaac and, uh, and Ishmael, but, uh, we find deeply she's talking about Jesus Christ, about who was going to come in, in the seed of Abraham, actually the nature of, uh, of man after the fall. Wherefore, in all things, it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, uh, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the, of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. So we, we find Jesus Christ coming in the uh, nature of, uh, of man, partaking of the flesh, nature of Adam after the fall. Uh, and um, actually for him to be an example to us, he had to be just like we are. He has to just feel pain like we are because also in Hebrews chapter four, we are told that he was tempted in all points as we are. So he cannot be someone superior than, the, uh, than us in the, for him to be our example. In what aspect was he our example in the human nature, but uh, taking uh, our, uh, our human uh, uh, human nature, having the human mind. And actually in, uh, in Luke chapter two, verses 42, 52, we are told that he increased in wisdom and knowledge. And so uh, it just tells me that when Christ was born, actually he was uh, just growing just like a an, an child could be so that we can actually uh, we can be able to look at him as, an, as our end example and know that we are able to, uh, to, overcome, to overcome sin. And uh, that is what I can, I, can, uh, I can add. Thank you. Thank you, brother uh, Wycliffe. To, to just uh, add on what you have submitted before, also I uh, welcome someone. CTR, Christ Triumphant 213.4, 213.5. As God, he could not be tempted, but as man, he could be tempted. And that strongly and could yield to the temptations. His human nature must pass through the same test and trial Adam and Eve passed through. His human nature was created, it did not even possess the angelic powers. It was human identical with our own. He was passing over the ground where Adam fell. He was now where if he endured the test and trial in behalf of the fallen race, he will redeem Adam's disgraceful failure and fall in our humanity. A human body and a human mind were his. He was born of our bone and flesh of our flesh. 
He was subject to disappointment and trial in his own home among his own brethren. He was not surrounded as in the heavenly courts with pure and lovely characters. He was compassed with difficulties. He came into our world to maintain pure, sinless character and to refute Satan's lie that it was not possible for human beings to keep the law of God. And then uh, 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 something else is that uh, uh, I wanted to just uh, point out also uh, yeah. is um, it is in uh, yeah it is in uh, one sm 244.1 the humanity of the son of god is everything to us it is the golden chain that binds our souls to christ and through christ to god this is to be our study. Christ was a real man. He gave proof of his humility in becoming a man. Yet he was God in the flesh. When we approach this subject, we will do well to heed the words spoken by Christ to Moses at the burning bush. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where on thou standest is holy ground. Exodus 3.5. We should come to this study with the humility of a learner, with a contrite heart. And the study of the incarnation of Christ is a fruitful study, which will repay the searcher who digs deep for hidden truth. And so really that uh, supports uh, uh, actually what uh, my two brethren have submitted. I'll go to the next level of uh, the study after establishing really Jesus Christ had human nature. And it is good for us because uh, it helps us to know that uh, a humanity, when it grabs to uh, the omnipotent, it can overcome sin because we have been told Christ did not to come to show us what God will, could do, but uh, what man could do. I'll go now to the second part of it. The book of Psalms says, a man cannot pay ransom for a man. No human sacrifices is accepted by God. Now we have said Jesus Christ came in human nature. We go to the other side because um, in order for humanity to be reconciled to humanity, there are two things that has to happen that humanity must come and uh, uh, be able to feel what humanity goes through, overcome sin, and then be able uh, to represent us. But again, we are told that no human being can offer sacrifice for any other human being. So we go back to Genesis that every kind must produce of its own kind. And after establishing that, I'll go to the next point that Christ was divine. And that is... Uh, uh, the book of uh, 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 Genesis, as we have said that of the same kind, it must be of the same kind to reproduce of the same kind. If Christ could only offer humanity, then we remain, we will remain in that without any power to be connected to the divinity. So for Christ to come to redeem us, he must have our own kind, but also to give us the nature that is the divine nature of God, he must also possess the divine nature so as to give us, we may be partakers of the same. Look at the book of John chapter three, looking at the issue that we had in Genesis of the same kind. Uh, John chapter three and uh, verses, uh, verses uh, six. This is... Uh, a dialogue between Jesus Christ and Nicodemus. And uh, Jesus Christ tells Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto you, verse 5, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So a man must be born of the spirit and water to enter into the kingdom of God. Now we have established Jesus Christ came in human nature. And so if he only had human nature, he cannot procure us heaven, but he must have also something divine to give us so that we may be partakers of the kingdom of God. And so he must be born of the spirit. He must be having 
the spirit to give us so that we must be partakers of the kingdom of heaven. So in as much as he came as a human nature to show us that human can be able to overcome sin, also he procured or he had something to give unto the human family. So the family of God is reconciled and the family of humanity is reconciled too. And then they become one family as it were in the beginning. The God man and the son of man. The son of God and the, son, the man's son. You understand those terms. And so in verse six, it says, that which is born of flesh is flesh. If we are human, we are human. But that which is born of the spirit is the spirit. And so it is only if Christ was born of the spirit, then he must give us the same as we are humans so that we may be part of the family of God. And this idea of Jesus Christ having divi divinity in him, it is Second Peter tells us the reason why he has to have this. Second Peter chapter one, verses four. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by this he might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through uh, uh, uh uh, through lust. And so he must have that eternal spirit. When you read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, it says that uh, how Jesus Christ offered himself spotless by the <clears throat> eternal spirit. So he must have eternal spirit to be able to give humanity what they do not have. But his overcoming is the overcoming of the humanity because by faith he had to overcome not by exercising any divine power, but by relying on the Father for that eternal spirit to be able to overcome sin. John chapter 3, verse 34, him who the Father has sent, he giveth him the spirit without measure. Why? So that he may, that the sacrifice may not be human sacrifice, but it may be divine, infinite uh, sacrifice. And um, just to add, uh, something, and then uh, 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 and then uh, uh, open up uh, submissions that uh, uh, my brethren may be able uh, uh, to to bring in their submissions. Uh, the last 5BC 1129.3, and then I welcome my, my brethren to offer their submissions. It says, but although Christ's divine glory was for a time veiled and eclipsed by his human, assuming humanity, yet he did not, yet he did not cease to be God when he became man. The human did not take the place of the divine, nor the divine of the human. This is the mystery of godliness. The two expressions, human and divine, were in Christ and inseparably one. And yet they had a distinct individuality. Though Christ humbled himself to become man, the Godhead was still his own. The Godhead is the divine. His deity could not be lost while he stood faithful and true to his loyalty. Surrounded with sorrow, suffering, and moral pollution, despised and rejected by the people to whom had been entrusted the oracles of heaven, Jesus could yet speak of himself of the Son of Man in heaven. He was ready to take once more his divine glory when he took his work on, when his work on earth was done. And so we see these two individualities existing in Christ, but inseparably one. And to that point, I'd like to hear uh, more submission on the humanity of Jesus Christ and his divinity and how important it is to us. Welcome.
Brother Wycliffe where, uh, of War. Uh, no, Brother Wycliffe of Mondi, welcome. You raised your hand. Oh, no. I did not oh. raise my hand. But you did I, not I, lower I it. Okay, let me lower it. <laughs> Is there anyone I who has no sub submission? Yes, I, yes, I can add something. Yes. Um, Christ being divine and uh, also being human. Uh, in a in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5, tells us that uh, uh, sacrifice and offering you would not, but a body as thou prepared me. There is uh, the human, human body <coughs> that was prepared for Christ. But uh, we find that uh, uh, the divine spirit was in Christ. The mind of God was in Christ and the human body was like uh, uh, the carrier of that. And so uh, the divinity could only operate, or the, the spirit, the mind of God could only operate uh, if there was uh, a body, a casket or something that can uh, make it operate. And so that was the human, a human, human body. And so Christ actually exercised the will of, of, uh, of his father. The spirit of his father was in him. And that is what enabled him to overcome. And uh, we've all, uh, maybe we have read uh, the, the quote that says that the, the, the temptation, the greatest temptation that Christ had was to use his divinity. He was able to... To, to use his divinity, but he submitted, he surrendered his will to the Father so that uh, he may actually uh, do that which the Father, uh, the, the Father wills for him. And so uh, if you read uh, the book of Hebrews chapter five, verses seven, uh, from verses eight, verses uh, seven, eight, and nine, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was hard in that he feared, though he was a son, yet learn, learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, uh, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So it was through obedience that actually Christ exercised uh, the divine, uh, the divinity or the spirit of the father in him. Actually, he surrendered. And that is the only way we ourselves, we can be partakers of that divine nature, surrendering our will. So that uh, actually when we subject ourselves so that it is not our thought, but the divine thought, the divine mind and spirit of God in us. That is what makes us to be omnipotent. That was COL 3, I think 333.3, that it, when we surrender our will, uh, we become uh, omnipotent. So I can say that Christ, the human, the human body was like uh, the carrier of the divine mind of God, and so he was able to exercise uh, that will of the Father because he surrendered. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, before I give the brethren in Rongo, uh, just to add this uh, on what uh, Brother Wycliffe has said, think of Christ's humiliation. He took upon himself fallen, suffering human nature, degraded and defied by sin, uh, he took our sorrows, bearing our grief and shame. He endured all the temptations wherewith man is beset. He united humanity with divinity. A divine spirit dwelt in a temple of flesh. He united himself with the temple. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us because by so doing he could associate with the sinful, sorrowing sons and daughters of Adam. So uh, 
uh, Christ could not come with the divine glory, but had the body had to be prepared. According to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, he says that, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wilt not, but a body hast thou prepared me. So a body was prepared to host the divine spirit. A body was prepared to host the uh, divine spirit so that uh, uh, by uh, reaching unto divinity uh, through the faith, uh, he had that divinity, but uh, only could not be used for the advantage. It was for him to be tempted unto the uttermost. But then uh, he could cling to the Father to be able to overcome sin because the greatest temptation that Christ ever had is to use his divinity, which he did not, but only we are told it was used to relieve human wants, but it was not used for his own advantage. Brother Patrick Angasa first, and then Brother Junior Sirungu. Elder Patrick, welcome. Thank you. Um, greetings, everyone. Greetings, brother. Uh, good. Um, indeed, this is a wonderful mind, as the prophet clearly says. Um, it's a subject that all discretion must really be exercised. Yes. So that, um, uh, because in this study, it is easy to drift off even with just, um, just even in innocence, you can easily drift out. Sure. And um, also, it's a subject that we must be very tolerant um, to allow certain lines that people may say that doesn't take us away from the truth. But again, it's a subject whereby certain lines cannot be accepted. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very important study. Um, I just want to pick uh, from where Brother Wycliffe has left. Now, the biggest question is, what is divinity when we speak of Christ? You know, that's the biggest question. What is divinity when we speak of Christ? And we are now clear, I believe many of us, that the divine sonship of Christ is based on his first birth. If we get that clearly, then we will be able to handle, because um, what, what is the source of Christ's divinity? It is his first birth, his first birth. Now, when he got his second birth, did he lose his first birth? No, he did not. Now, so if we understand it that way, it will be very easy. Now, um, we have to be very careful not to fall to a certain doctrine called uh, docetism. Now, whereby uh, those people who were preaching that doctrine in the second and the third century, and maybe it's still here today, they, they were almost suggesting that there was no human Christ, there was just an appearance, or the father came and dwelt in the body. And, you know, that must be really, we must really be careful so that I want to hear, Brother uh, Weekly, very well that um, that text, which has been uh, quoted by friends severally, let's pick that uh, text in Second Corinthians, uh, chapter five, verse nineteen. There, that God was in Christ. God was in Christ. Now we have to be very careful there. Now, how was God in Christ? How was God in Christ? It must be the same way that God is in us. So that look here. If we for a moment take that um, God was in Christ and such that by default, then Christ obeyed God, then we, we have no savior. As to that way, there we, must be, there we must be very careful. If we take it that the, the, um, that the divine mind of God was when Christ was born the second time, you know, we cannot explain incarnation. I know I, we, we can't do that. But I'm trying to say, if we think that it was by default, that is automatically the mind of God was in Christ, such that Christ obeyed by that default mind of God that was in him, then we have no savior. So then when the Bible says God was in Christ, God was in Christ, what does it mean? What does it mean carefully? Because that is where really we must study. And I will really hope to hear views there. When the Bible says God was in Christ, does that suggest that um, 
it was by default and not by choice. Now, that's why I'm insisting that when we understand divinity of Christ, uh, it will be easy for us to deal with all those verses where we say, even Sister White says God was in flesh. Now, but look here, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, um, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, I don't have my Bible here, Brother Sam, you can help me. Uh, it's in the bag, but uh, I decided to do this from somewhere I was going, uh, somewhere and uh, I needed to participate still. Now, how did Christ um, overcome? He learned obedience. I mean, there's that verse in Hebrews chapter 5 that, that he is, learned uh, obedience. That is from verse 7, Brother Angus. Yes. Um, um, verse 8, I'll read. Though he were a son. Look here. So now, what is, what is the verse speaking here? The verse is speaking of Christ the man. Now, but again, Paul now is saying, Paul being a son, which son? Not the son of man, the divine son. Now, that's what Paul is saying. Though he were a divine son, Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Now look here. So it wasn't like God was in him. So divinity was in him. So by default, then that's how he was obedient. No, then we must really understand that, that it was by choice that God was in Christ. Now, but don't forget that by the second birth, he doesn't lose the first birth. Now, kindly again, Brother Sam, help me. Yes. Uh, you can go to the chapter yes. called The Temptation in Deserved Ages. Okay, I'll be there. Yeah, and let's check. Uh, you can help me find the words. Christ could not prove his divinity. Now, look, Satan asks Jesus, um, 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 tell Jesus, if you are hungry, turn these stones into bread. Then somewhere, Sister White, on that passage will say, Christ was not to prove his divinity, meaning Christ was not to prove his divine sonship, his sonship, his birth. So anytime we speak of Christ and divinity, the first place to consult is his first birth. So if we can carefully learn that Christ never lost his first birth by the second birth, then we know we always had a divine son here. But now that does mean that, that, does mean that he came with the mind, the omnipotent, omniscient mind of God. I will say no there. Such that when we see God was in Christ, when we say God was in Christ, it must be by the agency of the word. So that Christ always said he spoke the words of God. And by faith kept on speaking the words of God. Such that if at any time he stopped speaking the words of God, he will have lost the divine connection. So then we must remove the idea of default. There it must be, uh, we must be very careful about that. So that when God was in Christ, it means the word of God was in Christ by choice. Not by default, by some, some settings like that. No, 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 no. It was like Christ chose to have the mind of God all the time. All the time he chose to have the mind of God. It wasn't like there was a dwelling inside the flesh, the mind of God in, 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 a, in, a, in a default way. It means to me that Christ chose to hear God and saw God was in Christ by the agency of his word, which word Christ kept. And when he died, because he kept that divine word the, which God had given him, which was written about him, and he had read also, he was reading, his mother was teaching him as well, and he believed those things. And he was now teaching us to also obey by hearing the word of God, so that faith cometh by hearing. And he also, um, he obeyed by hearing. Now, kindly, one more, just a text. I hope that one was very clear there that um, Jesus was not to prove his divinity which meant his sonship, divine sonship, especially that Satan knew uh, that Christ was the divine son of God. And so Jesus was not to prove by a miracle that he was the son of God by birth. And now Jesus says, Sister White says, Christ was not to prove his divinity, meaning his sonship. So once we are very sure that Christ never lost his first birth by the second birth, then we are sure now we are able to handle how God was in Christ. And the same, same way God is in Christ is the same way God is in us. Now, the difference is for us, we need a mediator. So God is in us by the mediator Christ. Now, but God was in Christ without mediatorship because Christ did not commit any sin. And so by choice, and we too by choice, God may be in us because remember the ministry of reconciliation that Christ had by God being in him, by the agency of the word of God, 
we too receive that same ministry of reconciliation by Christ being in us. And when Christ is in us, meaning the word of Christ being in us, which is the word of God, so the Father and Son are in us. And that's how we are to understand 2 Corinthians and all those texts and quotations that for me will speak to God being in Christ. If that is clear, then it will not be default that, that now there was this mind of God in Christ um, by default. No, no, that's not the idea. So um, um, if, we, if we look at... That way, then it will be, it will fall. Sorry, sorry, that because of a call. So Christ was a man here, but he never lost his divine sonship. So he still had his Godhood, which he could still have lost. Remember, if he sinned, he will have lost his divine sonship. Now, what does that mean to us? We are born men, and then by the second birth, we partake of the divine nature. And we too, in, the, in, in our fight with sin, if we sin, we lose the divine nature that we have received. And so Christ will have received, we will have lost his first birth by dying eternally if he had sinned. And that is if he had lost connection with the Father, with the divine mind of the Father by faith. So I will, I will my point, I'm insisting there that the divine mind um, of God, which was in Christ, was by choice, meaning because Christ was a full man. You know, many people sometimes think that Christ was a man, meaning the body, that the body that God prepared. I think there is that quote, that original quote that Brother Sammy read. Uh, let me see if I put it down. A CTR 213, paragraph 5, and 213, paragraph 4. Christ had a human body and a human mind. So sometimes when how we read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5 is dangerous because many people think it is just a human body without a mind. No. That's a half man. That's even a dead man. <laughs> it was like Adam without the mind. That is a dead Adam, you know? So Christ did not come here a, a dead a second Adam. He was a living um, uh, Adam, second Adam, with body and mind. So now having a body and mind of a man without losing the original first birth, then by choice he partook of the mind of God. So God was in him. So that's really, I really want to guard that. May I hear, brethren, what they think? That's, those are my thoughts initially. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Brother Ngasa, for your submission. Uh, the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 2, says that uh, Jesus grew in stature, in wisdom, uh, uh, in wisdom, in favor or with God and in favor with man. And so we see that um, as a human, a being, he grew into these things, not as a divine being, but as a, a human being, he, he, he grew into these things. And uh, 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 I love your submission, but uh, later I'll come with a, a question to you. But I'll welcome Brother Junior Sirungu because he had raised his hand. Brother Junior Sirungu, go ahead. Uh, yes, th thank you. Uh... On, on, on that on that point of uh, uh, the divinity of Christ, I, I wanted us to look at um, uh, what Peter said after the, re the receiving of the Holy Ghost at Pentecost. Uh, I see in his preaching, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, uh, starting from verse 14 onwards, you get to see how Peter really relates uh, the spirit and the actions that the people were doing because this same anointing that uh, the people had was the same anointing that Christ had and it's the same works. So when we get to verse 27 onwards, we get to see that he's, he's drawing a difference as to the reason why Christ was resurrected. So the point is really on Christ's resurrection. And as far as Christ's divinity is concerned, he, he went and looked at, oh, the spirit of God led him to look at Psalms chapter 16 from verse 8 to 11. And he says that he always, or Christ always had the face of the father before him. So Christ having the face of the father before him really made him depend on God because he knew that if he had the face of the father always 
before him, it means he was right next to him. So there's nothing that could shake him, which that same, same attribute that Christ had is the one that is being given to us through his spirit. And I'm beginning to learn that when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's really emphasizing on what that resurrection did for us. And that resurrection, it's really Paul preaching about that resurrection. And it's referring to we receiving Christ's spirit so that he can, when the trumpet sounds, he can resurrect us because his spirit is in us. I, I, I noticed that uh, in verse 32, meaning 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32, it says, if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage it me if the dead raise not? Let us not eat, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. No, no, let's, it's verse 31, sorry. I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. So dying daily is really looking at the life of Christ, what he did, because that is really Philippians chapter 2, what uh, Sami did tell us earlier of Christ really uh, offering himself and taking the form of a man so that he can die. All these things that Christ did, if you were to look at Psalm 16, 8 to 11, he did so that he can die. We can see all the um, obedience or the painful ways or the painful things that Christ went through to learn obedience was for him to die. And that death was really the certification of him receiving that life of God or receiving a value that he didn't deserve for himself. He really didn't need that value because he's eternal himself. So him being in the human form and dying is Christ dying or a person who's sinless dying and receiving life that he didn't need for himself. So he comes and gives it to us. So when we die daily, as Paul has said, we receive that spirit of Christ that is that added value that he got to give us. So when we look at how that divine, uh, the divine power of God has making that Christ was a new creation. For God had to start with a new creation. He had to start with Jesus. That's why in, is it... Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, as you can, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, let me see, 15 and verse 45 onwards, it says, so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, the last man, Adam, was a quickening spirit. So, as you continue, it says, how be it that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards, that which is spiritual, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is of the Lord. So it's really trying to draw a difference between that life of Christ and our lives right now. So if we accept Christ, we are accepting that spirit of which it is revealed by the actions that we do. And Christ's, resur Christ's resurrection is really that seal to connect us to God. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to go to the last part of our presentation. I want to go to the last part of our presentation. And uh, I'd like to engage everyone, but uh, I first want to engage Brother Angasa in a very friendly way, in a very friendly way. So Elda, Angasa, prepare for your submission. Uh, I'll start with Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 where you talk about um, the body, when we read the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse five, what it means. And uh, it reads thus, that uh, wherefore when he cometh into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering thou wilt not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Now we have been told in uh, Youth Instructor December 2019, uh, Zero zero paragraph seven that uh, 
the divine spirit dwelt in human flesh. And so what is Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5 really talking about? I'd like to share a quote and then uh, uh, we try to discuss it just in a moment. Nearly 2000 years ago, this is DA 23.1 uh, DA 23.1, nearly 2,000 years ago, a voice of mysterious import was heard in heaven. From the throne of God, lo, I come. Sacrifice and offering thou wilt not, but a body thou hast prepared me. So the body, lo, I come in the volume of the books. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Hebrews 10, verses 5 to 7. In these words is announced the fulfillment of the purpose that had been hidden from eternal ages. Christ was about to visit our world and to become incarnate. He says, a body has thou prepared me. Had he appeared with the glory that was with, his, with the Father before the world was, we could not have endured the light of his presence. That we might behold it and not be destroyed, the manifestation of his glory was shrouded. His divinity was veiled with, with humanity, the invisible glory in the visible human form. My question and my trying to understand what you said, Eldangasa, is this. And I'll say what I understand with the verse and with the quote that Christ's glorious body, he gave up. It was hidden in the human flesh. So when Christ comes on the earth, actually, he doesn't have the divine glorious body. He has the human body. And that human body is where we have two distinct individualities dwelling in. Now I go to CTR. Uh, uh, CTR, that is, uh, what was it? CTR 213.4. Uh, in a moment, CTR 213.4 and 5. It says that uh, no, 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 not this one, but uh, 5 BC, sorry. Uh, 5 BC, 12, uh, 11, 29.3, 11, 20, 29.3. Oh, 11, 11, uh, 29.3, yeah. It says the human, but although Christ's divine glory was for a time veiled and eclipsed by his, him assuming humanity, so the divine body, the divine glory, or the glorious body was veiled in humanity. So the body of Christ was not the divine body, but actually the human body. And that human body is what occupied the two humanity and the divinity. Yet he did not cease to be God when he became man. The human did not take the place of the divine nor the divine of the human. This is the mystery of godliness. The two expression human and divine were in Christ closely and inseparably one. So one body having the divine and having the human. And, uh, and uh, yet they had distinct individuality. So the divine had uh, it is individuality and the human had it is individuality, but in one body. Though Christ humbled himself to become man, the Godhead was still his own. Now the Godhead consists of the omnipresence, the, uh, the omnipresence, the omnipotent and the omniscient. But now here we have a human having two individualities, having a human mind, and a human body, but having a divine also individuality existing, not humanized, but still Godhead. But um, uh, 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 now the body, the divine body is not there. This divinity is using the human body and the two are in one. My uh, really simple issue is uh, Brother Ngasa. Do you see this as I see, I'm seeing that uh, Christ had the Godhead, that is the omnipotence, the omnipresent, and uh, the, the, the omniscient in him as 
a distinct individuality and also having the human, also having human mind, mind as city Ari says, and uh, uh, human body. Uh, do you see that, uh, Brother Angasa? Because that is what I try to see in the quotes. Thank you, Brother Sami. We pray the Lord for this opportunity uh, where we are to exercise our liberty with grace and humility. Thank you. Um, and we must not be fearful or worried that it will uh, bring any harm to express ourselves kindly and honestly what we believe so that we may learn. Um, and that's, that's the idea. Um, on this, I, I think you, you now you have raised two issues. The, my, simp, my first simple issue was easy, and that one I, I know easily we can, uh, we can sort that out. The second one now, after what you have said, will what I would like us to learn Maybe we might need more time, maybe not today alone, but um, uh, we could even extend later into our inboxes or for the benefit of all, we may share those things. Now, what I, on Hebrews 10, 5, the initial thing I was trying to say was, and I agree with you, is that many people, when they read the word body, we have to be very careful. Many people read the word body, meaning that it was flesh without mind. So that they don't understand that even the word flesh will mean will include mind, such that they will think that here um, uh, um, the body was without mind. So we, you see, that is not a man. A man is not a man. A man has um, a man has a body and a mind. Praise the so Lord. We, I'll just cut you for a short time and say praise yeah. the Lord for that, Brother Angasa, because even if you are looking on the screen. A human body and a human mind were his. His he was born of our bone and flesh of our flesh. So that's what body is human plus the mind. Very good, bro. That's all Thank I was saying. So that's much. all I was saying. That's what I, in fact now the, the other issue you have brought, um, uh, which is also very big. But from what you had picked earlier, and I, I actually was I was happy with this quote. Um, I'm relying on this quote which you said, but I know I can get more more quotes because he when I, a human being is not. Not just a mind is dead. A body without a spirit is dead. Yes. Um, and so Jesus, um, the, when we speak of Hebrews 5 and any other verse or any quotation from Sister White speaking of Christ taking um, uh, human nature, human body, it will mean mind and body. And sometimes with mental powers, we can speak all that, that mental abilities, will and all that. He had all that. So, um, um, to 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 that sorted because now that we are very clear um, that indeed when we speak of human body we mean human body and mind because you are not a man when you you are you just have a body without a mind so um, that's the, that's the point now on the second part um, um, let me it's something really we need to check carefully um, about the attributes of God uh, which Christ came with. Uh, we we that's where I really want us to check. Can you find for me a quote quickly? Yes. Just one, but I could share it from the scriptures and many other quotes. But for now, let's just get go directly and see the matter. Um, we would need to check the the words. I want you to note the word hid, the word veil, and the word lay down. So what do we mean by hid, veil, and laid down? Okay. Yes. So now, but check for me. Go to deserve ages and quote the word repost. Repost. R E P O S E D. Repost. Then I'll show you something. Okay, this is DA three thirty six point one that he repost in quiet. Okay, now um, I could I um, uh, just uh, let me just read it. I can see it. Thank you for putting it. When Jesus was awakened to meet the storm, he was in perfect peace. There was no trace of fear in word or look, for no fear was in his heart. But he rested not in possession of almighty power. Look here. He had no, he had, he had no omnipotence, he, at least from that quote, okay? But I'm not in, I will not be insisting for now. I just wanted to alert us. Yeah. There was no trace of fear in his word or look, for no fear was in his heart, but he rested not in the possession of, 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 of almighty power. It was not as the master of earth and sea and sky that he reposed in quiet. No, 
that power he had laid down. That power, to me, laid down, meaning he did not have it. That's how I, I take it for now, but I'm willing to learn. And he says, I can of, of, of my own self do nothing. Um, nothing. He trusted in the Father's might. Now, might there will stand for almighty power, will stand for uh, omnipotence. Okay? Um, it was in faith, faith in God's love, that love can also be construed to mean power and care that Jesus rested and the power of that word which stilled the storm was the power of God, okay? That is omnipotence. So I'm looking at it this way there, that um, there are certain attributes, um, um, there are certain attributes which Christ, when he was here, in fact, he wouldn't have. That now look, he never lost his divine sonship, but there are certain things he was stripped. For example, he was stripped of the glories. That's why we see him praying for the glory. Um, he was stripped of the form. We see that, and we can read that in Philippians chapter two. And um, I, I, I somehow don't believe. Uh, for example, let's get. There's another quote which I it has been used somewhere else, which we can again study quickly. You remember that um, uh, quote, which has been understood to mean disembodied when it means divesting. Do you remember where it says? Being cumbered with humanity, he could not be everywhere, meaning he could not be omnipresent. So when Christ was here, that quote will suggest to me that when Christ was here, he was not omnipresent because he was cumbered with humanity. Now, so I don't know whether that quote could easily be picked, brother cumbered. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Now, let me try read that one again. Uh, how it says, but divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof, cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Now look here. But now we know right now, Christ is in every place personally by agency of his holy angels. Now look here. But then, cumbered with humanity, then, before he was glorified, it was not possible for him to do that. So um, um, I'll be suggesting that um, 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 I, th I thank God, first of all, we are clear that when the Bible speaks of body, uh, Christ took the body, human, human body. It means um, human body as we know it, mind and body. And now when we speak of the attributes of God, uh, there are certain attributes, like there's one attribute that I've really opposed um, and, and I put it on public, that it is not correct to say that Jesus was immortal here. I know brethren who say that. Uh, I don't know uh, if uh, there's one here who will say that. But um, honestly, it will be very hard for me to believe that because one, in fact, uh, we're going to... Um, Wagner, the, the younger, says the chief attribute of God is immortality. Now, now, what is immortality? That which cannot die. So if Christ was immortal here, then he could not die. And, and, and that's one attribute which he was stripped of in order for him to, while remaining a divine son of God, he was stripped of immortality. Then he will seek for it and bring it to light through obedience. And so um, there, there, what, what, what attributes of, uh, of, of, of God did Christ not lose when he came here? Of course, he never lost his divine sonship. He still had the ability to forgive sin through the power of the Father. Um, 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 and um, what else? What else? Um, he never lost his name. He never lost his origin um, and all that. But I will be now wanting to learn uh, because I know from several quotations of the spirit of prophecy, we will get this one um, um, saying this way, and we may not hear it very well, but I know we can find the harmony uh, to get all these things clearly. But for me now, I'm just trying to say that he wasn't omnipresent here. Um, he wasn't omniscient here. Um, and, um, and those he left with the power for, he left with the father for a season, and then he will search that for me that is the mystery of incarnation that he who was omniscient he who was omnipresent he who was immortal for a season came to look for all those things such that we know all the miracles he did were of the power of the father through the agency of angels that's how i look at it brother sammy but we can study more i'm willing to learn on that matter it's something that i'm willing to learn thank you so much uh, brother angasa and uh, maybe before i just give brian a chance to speak uh, I'd like you to maybe in just a few minutes, two or three, uh, when Sister White says that uh, he had two distinct individualities in him and um, the Godhead was in him and uh, the humanity was in him, but uh, 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 they, they, they existed uh, uh, distinctly. It had different individualities, but they were in one. 
what, uh, uh, what do you understand by uh, him having the other divine individuality existing uh, inseparably uh, as a, an individuality in him, but uh, inseparably with the humanity? What do you understand by that? Thank you, Brother Sami. Um, that's a very important question, but I know we are, will still be insisting with God. I know there, there are some, and I know we, I hope we don't say that here. There yes. are some who say that uh, Jesus, because he had, there are some who say that Jesus had divinity and uh, humanity, that only humanity was tempted, and so only humanity died, and such manner of things. Now, I think that's not what we are handling. We are yes. trying to just un handling the two distinct natures. Yes. Um, and to retain so that we don't fall into the heresies that were, remember the things we are discussing now, these, these heresies were there in the past. Indeed, humanity never became divinity. And divinity never became humanity. So quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with, our, let's deal with ourselves. We are first born, we are first born human. Then we are born divine. Now, do we, be, do we now, do, does our human nature become now divine? Do we lose the human nature? No, we don't. So similarly, Christ was born back in eternity as a divine son. When he was born the second time, he never lost the divine sonship, right? That's where, how I look at it. Now, Just was there... Sure. Sa yeah. He did not lose divine sonship if he by didn't the lose, second by, the, by the second birth. So what yeah. constitutes this divine ship that uh, he did not lose when he came as human, humanity? Very good. He, yeah. Very good. Now, it will include all the attributes of God. Yes. That is what will divinity will mean. But look here. In order for him to be placed into probation, there are certain things which were stripped um, the, the, uh, that he left. It's, that's why we, Sister White will call it the wonderful condensation. The wonderful condensation. Uh, so we could study that, Brother Sami. Um, uh, look here. Okay. Oh, thank, thank you. Now, um, look here. Let me give you one aspect that he lost. Yeah. Divinity, full divinity, cannot be tempted of sin. Yeah. So if Christ was here with that incapability of being tempted, because we know the Bible says God cannot be tempted of sin. And Christ was here with the capability of just not being tempted, but of also falling. Okay? He yeah. could have been tempted, and he could have, number one, let's praise the Lord that our Savior was faithful all the while. Because he could have been tempted and there was possibility of him sinning. Now, with God the Father, it is not possible. I mean, not even with God the Father. I mean, with, with divinity in its, in its perfect sense, in its fullness, um, 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 it is not possible to tempt God. In fact, can I tell you something? When Christ was in heaven, um, uh, when Christ was in heaven, before he came here, man, he could not be tempted. He could not be tempted. Now, but when he was here, he could be tempted. Now, how was that possible? Then he had to be stripped uh, from that inability of being tempted, right? Secondly, Christ died. Christ died. Now, one attribute of divinity is immortality. And the reason why the Father never came here to die for us, we know for sure, is that the Father cannot die. That's the only reason. In fact, I, I, have, a, I have a small sermon about John 3.16 and how it has been misunderstood uh, because I ask people, which father sends his son to die and we call that love? That's not love. I mean, that's not love. Even on the street, we see a father who could have uh, um, uh, died and let his son live, and yet he chose to live and let his son die. That father is a bad father. Then we teach John 3, 16, telling people, the father cannot die. And so he so loved his son so dearly, but he still gave him to us. And that's how we have to understand John 3, 16, that the father really, if the father could die, he would have, who will have come and died for us, but immortality cannot die. So Christ um, um, received immortality from the Father and conditional immortality, but he laid it to the hands of the Father. That one, um, we can read that severally, spoken of by uh, Sister White. Um, um, Sister White doesn't mention that, but she says that Christ was mortal here. I know many pioneers spoke of uh, immortality being left on the Father's hands, and that one I could easily show if I had time, not now. So, um, and even on that issue of omnipotence, um, um, uh, we see that even from that just one quote that he did not repose as one possessing um, 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 almighty power that one he had laid down so we could check what does it mean to lay down and then we learn on that and then 
cumbered with humanity when he was here, he could not be everywhere present. Meaning, when, when we say when you are not everywhere present, we just mean you are not omnipresent. So, uh, Brother Samuel, we could check that. Um, um, I, I'm, I, will, I will be open to hear these things uh, because um, I've taken time to study them. And, but I'm willing to learn. I know there's a lot to learn and unlearn. And um, um, we could put all the quotes together and all the texts together and see that. Um, yeah, I want to leave it there, Brother Sami, for now. Thank you so much, Brother Angasa. Brother Brian, you, you have been, your hand has been up. Please go ahead and mute yourself. Well, I'd just like to ask a question. Uh, the way that, uh, we know that Christ has the human nature that he, 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 he got when, during the incarnation, but we are saying it includes a human mind. How do we mean that Christ still has a human mind now? Or did the mind change and the body remain the same? Oh, that is good. That is a good question. Anyone responding to that? Does Christ still have a human mind as he has gone to heaven? Because he came and he had a human mind and a human body. When he went up, did he retain a human mind? Uh, Brother Sami, yes. can I attempt that? Yes, please, Junius. I, I know it's somewhat difficult, and I am happy that you started this discussion with. Uh, we are no, yes, you did. We, Brother Junius, we, go ahead. Irungu. We are, we are treading on holy ground right now. It is really holy ground trying to say things like this. And to be really looking at who Christ is, if we are to look at Christ, yes, he had the human body and the human mind. But the part where he was connected with the father was divine. So his physical part, meaning having this human body and the human mind, yes, it is human. But the part where he is thinking, he, he was really of the father, it's of the spirits, it's of the spirit of the father. That's what I wanted to add. That's why in, in Philippians chapter two, verse seven, it's really talking about but made himself of no reputation and looked upon and took upon him the form of a servant. Really, it's just this body that we have, which you cannot really separate this body and the mind. You cannot. We see it as uh, it has to be one whole. And the part where Christ, Christ's mind happens to be that it's some, it is in the human flesh, but his mind, the way he was thinking, it was divine. It was divine. That is why when we look at him being a new creation, he was sinless. So we cannot really call him, really, he was born of the spirit. So his mind really was connected to God. So I, I guess, I don't know whether I'm making sense. Uh, thank you, Brother Junius, for that. Uh, hey, brother, could I say something to Brother Junius? Yes. Yeah, Brother Junius, uh, what, what Christ was connected to God by choice. Of course, the first birth gave him the first birth, the divine birth, the original birth, um, um, gave him a vantage point. But even we, when we get the second birth, we get a vantage point. Now, after that, when we get the vantage point, and that vantage point is by choice on our end. But Jesus never lost, look at, he never, you will never fight sin until you have that vantage point. You, there's no, all fight against sin without divine nature is lost. You will be losing every battle. That's why, and, and that's, that's really Romans chapter seven, that all the time Paul was fighting sin without partaking of divine nature, he was failing. But as soon as you partake of divine nature, you are fighting with the assurance of victory. But when you disconnect from, uh, from, 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 from divine connection by choice. So by choice, um, Demas, for example, I, the story of Demas is one of the studies. We just read a few lines. The, Paul reports that Demas has loved the world. 
meaning he had a divine connection to the Father, but he chose the world and so lost the divine connection. Now, Christ could have lost his first birth, that is the sonship, um, by sinning and losing the divine connection. So the divine connection between the Father and the Son was by choice. I really, um, that's what I'm insisting, really. It was by choice, by choice, by choice. Because he chose to obey. He could have chosen not to obey. And if he chose not to obey, he would have died the second death. I hope now we are clear that Jesus never died the second death. He died the first death uh, with the hope of resurrection. And indeed, he got resurrected. So all I'm insisting on my point there that is Christ was connected to the Father by choice. Even at that, at that, you see, at, when in the boat, for example, at that time in the boat, if he was not connected to the Father, he would have perished. He would have perished just like the rest there. So, and he was connected there. Look, he re, even when he was sleeping right there, he trusted fully in the Father. That's, that's, what I, what, that's what I get. That's what I get. That's what I get. I leave it there. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Angasa. Uh, for that submission, I, I, uh, I wouldn't want to draw any line on that, but uh, I hope uh, we are getting um, each other what we are talking about and uh, both sides are being benefited because this is not conclusive. We shall continue with this uh, discussion. Amen. Brother Brian asked uh, a question that is so tricky to me, maybe to others it will be simple, but uh, Brian, I'd like to submit something so short, not conclusive. Jesus Christ, we are told that uh, when he went to heaven, he went with a glorified human body. He retains humanity forever. So on that part, uh, where you ask, did, does he also retain a human mind? I'll just like to quote something from uh, the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 44, without elaborating so much on it. Uh, from 1 Corinthians 15, we are told, awake, from verse 34, awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But some man will say, how are the dead raised? And with what body do they come? Uh, thou fool, thou which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies, so and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. So the body will be raised in glory. And we have established the body and the mind. Uh, the body without the mind is not something it's something dead it is sown in weakness it is raised in power it is so natural body the ones that we have like this it is raised a spiritual body there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body and so it is written the first adam man uh, was made a living soul the last adam was made a quickening spirit but that doesn't mean that we are told God is a spirit, but he has a body. So if Christ is a spirit, he has also a body, which we cannot start explaining. How bad that was in not, not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. So when he was born, he was born with this natural body as a human. When he was resurrected, a glorified body. But who can say of that body? The first man is of the earth, earthy, 
the second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they that also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So I cannot describe for you the body that Christ has for now, although we know he retains humanity. There is an image of the heavenly. I have never been carried there to see it. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. So anything that is corrupted or that can be corrupted will not be part of the everlasting kingdom. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised in incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. Anything that can be corrupted and it gets corrupted, it will not be part of heaven. And this mortal must put on immortality. And now I, I'll just stop there and say, God says that no eye hath seen, no ear has heard what the Lord has prepared for those who love him. So uh, I, I can't uh, talk much about apart from what is revealed in First Corinthians chapter uh, 15, actually on that point, if he has a, 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 a human mind. Brother Brian, may you react to that before I give the last two minutes to maybe those who want to speak. Brother Brian. I, I, I hope to say something on what you have said on Brother Brian's question, but no yes. problem. Yes, go ahead. Um, I will invite everyone to study um, the document by James White called Pago, Personality of God. Now, you know of brethren whom we, have, you know our brothers, uh, you know our brother, our brother like Imad and Neda, whom we have differed about the spirit. Um, um, they somehow, when they read the verse that Christ is made a quickening spirit, they somehow think without a body. Now look here, James White says, and I agree with him, Christ has immortal bones. Immortal bones. That's what he says. You can read there carefully because man, um, um, Christ has, humanity has been glorified in Christ. Now look, let me, let me so, so that we understand, sometimes when we want to understand the scriptures beautifully more is to study Genesis. Now, look here. If Adam had not perished, he will have been our father and, and we will have been born in the image of God. Remember, because of sin, we were born in the image of Adam. But if Adam had not sinned, we will have been born in the image of God, which Adam had. So now, if Adam had not sinned, he would have retained the mind, the mind which God gave him, and, and, and a perfect way. So now, I will, I, I will not have any problem believing that Christ, as James White says, that he has immortal, um, uh, he has immortal flesh and immortal immortal bones. Look here, when we read the word flesh, one of the things which we, we, we might be careful to check, when the word flesh is read, most of the time, it is understood to mean the flesh, the nyama, the one you touch, the flesh, the, the one you touch on your hands. But it mostly doesn't mean that only. The word flesh will also mean carnal, will mean carnal, mean, and that will really be speaking to the mind. And no carnal mind will go to heaven. That one we can be sure. No carnal mind will go to heaven. And if I would like just to leave there, that um, if we keep, if man, if look here, Adam did not have a carnal mind as a man initially. He did not have a carnal mind. In fact, um, I like the way T. Jones explains about the carnal mind. He says the carnal mind is the mind of Satan. And so when we, so a carnal mind is accepted by choice. We, we, when we are born, we are born with tendencies towards it, right? So Christ did not have a carnal mind. He did not have a carnal mind. Even when he was here, he did not have a carnal mind. So fleshly mind is mind which loves sin. Now, Christ did not have that kind of mind, okay? So we can study all those things. I'm just saying that um, if, you look, if you carefully studied that document on, on, the, on the pag, what constitutes a man, um, um, we, we need to understand really what constitutes a man and then see when man is glorified, what will he not have, what will he not have? Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 indeed warns us not to, to tread very carefully there. But if you, I will request that we read James White and see what it speaks about um, how Christ, because he asks, what is Christ? Then he answers, he, he answers, um, material intelligence. Now, what does this say about the material intelligence of Christ? He says, immortal bones, immortal flesh. And um, yeah, that's, um, 
That's how, that I want to leave it there, Sami, but it's something we could still study around that part. What does it mean when we speak of flesh? Most of the time we think it's nyama. We think it's the meat. No, flesh, really, most of the time when we speak of flesh, um, look here, um, Brother Sami, uh, just, just to invite friends, when the Bible says uh, fleshly, fleshly lusts, it doesn't mean, many people think that sometimes the, some, um, that the body is willing, the spirit is, uh, the, body, the, body is, the body is weak, the spirit is willing. Many people think it's the nyama, it's the meat. No. When the Bible speaks like that, it speaks of the fleshly mind being weak, but the power of God being strong. That's what it means most of the time. So may I leave it there? Um, but I, I'm really blessed with the answer which you gave that um, um, that which is sown, when the seed goes down, it, 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 um, it, um, it, 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 it comes in a, a fresh something. But there's something, there's a verse in Psalms, Brother Sammy, there's a verse in Psalms that says that uh, Christ's body did not see corruption. Christ's body did not see corruption. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so and we can also think about it as we study these things. Um, I leave it there, God's grace. Christ was the unleavened bread. Romans 8, 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritual minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Brother Brian, before I give to those in Rongo, Brother Brian, can you say something before I give to those in Rongo? I believe he commented there saying, uh, I have no further comment. We can just continue. Oh, he wrote a message? Yes. Oh, I haven't seen it. I have no further comment. We can just continue. Uh, it's okay. I am inviting the brethren in Rongo to give us their last submission. Time is up. Then uh, we can... Uh, postpone the study of today. Jambo. At Jambo. Oh, this is cause gay. We, yes, thank God God for, we thank God for the studies and for the submissions and all the reactions and questions asked. I, I have a question, but as you said, if there will still be a chance for this discussion to be further, uh, we thank the Lord. Uh, my question actually is on that quote it's a common quote. Personally, I have not understood it. I actually think like this platform is very important for me to be led more. This quote about the divinity of Christ not dying, I get it from the book uh, Faith I Live By, page 51. It can be found elsewhere. So maybe Brother Sami, yes. maybe the president can help me maybe today or tomorrow in summary or in, in, in depth. Otherwise, apart from the question, we are sincerely praying that God may help each one of us as we air out our points that may be as simple as can be understood by everyone. Sometimes maybe they become so complex and they become more hard than we expected. So we are praying that God help each one of us to make them more simple and also that all of us might have, have the teachable spirits and we really wish to be together and we wish to be led of the spirit of God. So we pray also that all the hindrances might be removed. Otherwise, that's the, what I just wanted to say. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Gay, for your, uh, your request and uh, your question. Because we are past time, I would like us to handle uh, this as a um, uh, uh, the nature of Christ, part B, where we shall be looking at those quotes, which speaks about if he were, uh, if he had the three omnis, or if he didn't have them, and then we shall pick right tomorrow from your question, uh, the the issue that um, divinity did not die, divinity did not die. That is the first thing we shall be handling tomorrow when we pick up this part B. And uh, I pray that the Lord will bless us. Brethren uh, and sisters, I uh, want to thank you so much for availing yourself. We had not concluded, uh, and this is part A. Tomorrow is part B of what we have been learning today. And we shall start with the question that has been raised by Elder Kosgei. And so I'll just to say thank you for all of us who have availed themselves for this discussion. 
And uh, please be there tomorrow so that uh, we may be able to learn together. Otherwise, uh, Brother Kosge, I'd like to, to, to also pray that things will be simple. And uh, because this is an open forum, it is not uh, a sermon. Uh, we are free to say, uh, what you have said is complex. Can you just break it down so that somebody may understand it? I know I, I won't be offended. I know the brethren won't be offended and they will try to break it down completely so that uh, it may not seem technical. We don't want technical things. We want the gospel to be simple. Ellen G. White says that uh, in 1844, even little children could understand what, what was being taught. And this is why we want to have these studies. I know no one will be offended if you just say, Sami, that is so technical. Please try to explain better what you are saying so that a five years old child can be able to understand this and preach it to another person. I thank you for pointing out that. And uh, I hope in the future, all of us will have uh, really submissions which are, are actually edifying. I thank the Lord that uh, no one has been hurt uh, with anyone's word and uh, we can rest assured that uh, uh, the Lord is working with us. Otherwise, I want us to pray as uh, we finish up this session today. And uh, if there's still network in Rongo, maybe a short prayer will do, and then uh, we, can, uh, sub, uh, 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 we can dismiss each other. Any brother willing there in Rongo for the brethren gathered there to pray with us, please. Uh, thank you so much. This is Emmanuel, and uh, let us believe and have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity that you have given us that we may learn and thy word. It is thy pleasure and thy will that we may have the knowledge of the Father and of the Son, Jesus Christ, that was said unto us. And so as we uh, come together to study these solemn subjects, Lord, we pray that you may uh, bestow upon us the knowledge uh, of heaven, uh, that we may be enlightened and that, that we may have one mind. Bless the brethren that have taken their, their time to share with us, and may your will be done upon us, uh, as we'll be also coming together uh, tomorrow. Uh, we pray that you may always abide with us, and uh, bless us each and every time, as you keep us uh, from the temptations of the devil, that we may be righteous even unto salvation. May your will be done always in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. amen. God bless you all. Brethren, Amen. And uh, may his will be done in our lives. Hallelujah. God's grace to all of you. Bye for now, everyone. Till daybreak, when we shall gather, pray that the Lord gives us life. And as the pioneers used to part, so we part saying, may your name remain in the book of life. Amen. Amen.